torture machines have been among man's darkest secrets for thousands of years. Macabre devices designed to crush, stretch, burn, and inflict maximum pain. But which were the strangest, and how did they work? Ancient Discoveries probes the history of these instruments to explore a bloodlust that is truly bizarre. Did a demented Roman emperor drape his victims in a cloth of flames? Could ancient torturers have invented a device that ripped bone apart? And could the real Count Dracula have inflicted a lingering death by impaling his enemies with the precision of a surgeon? These are some of history's most horrendous death devices, investigated by ancient discoveries. Historical documents contain descriptions of injuries, mutilations, and deaths caused by torture machines. But are these accounts accurate? Ancient Discoveries has brought together a group of experts to test some of these devices to see how they really work. Our investigation begins with a physical examination of how tension can rip a body apart. For millennia, bodies have been stretched to inflict pain. This torture has been practiced in different ways, but always working on the same basic principle, to stretch a person until he or she breaks at their weakest point. There are historical accounts of how this strain acts on the body, but there's been little scientific evidence to support them until now. Traditionally, we regard joints as being the weakest part of the body because there's not bone across joints. Bone is visualized as being very hard and very resistant to uh, stress forces. Traditionally, if something's going to be ripped apart, it will be at a joint. But this may not always be true. What if ancient torturers designed a machine that applied tension to the body in such a way that it left joints undamaged and ripped bones apart instead? No self-respecting torture chamber would be complete without a rack. Um, it's uh, an absolutely ubiquitous item for persuasion. First used in ancient Greece, the rack has been popular for thousands of years. Torture was, was an accepted part of the legal system in ancient Greece. You weren't supposed to torture Greek citizens, but you could torture your slaves. Slaves in particularly ancient Greece, were hardly considered human. Um, they're often described as tools. One author refers to slaves as just being man-footed things, that they aren't really men. Um, and it was thought that one of the only ways that you could get truth out of slaves was literally to pull the truth out of them. Historical accounts contain startling details of how the rack acted on the body so cruelly racked at the pulleys that his limbs were forced apart at the joints. To see its effect on human bodies, Richard Windley has built a model of one of the earliest examples. Basically, what we've got is a long ladder frame, which is two main long supports with cross pieces. The main sort of windlass device is this end. This is what actually produces the tension or, or the pulling. Now, one of the critical elements of, um, of this device is the use of this, what we call, ratchet and pawl system, and that's a kind of locking device. And the, the point of this is that one can increase the tension incrementally so that each little click of this thing is going to give just another level of pull and yet more discomfort to the poor unfortunate who's actually tied down on the rack. Richard is joined in his experiment by trauma surgeon Dr. Mike Edwards. They hope to find out just what this slow build-up of tension does to the body. Richard and Mike are using a pig's leg to test the power of the rack. A pig's knee is a good substitute for a human knee because the joint's structures are of similar strength and position in both species. I'm sure that tension's being taken equally. There we go. Are we there? Yeah, I think we are. 
That's good. But when that goes. James Dean, a specialist in creating three-dimensional schematics, is using technology specifically designed for ancient discoveries investigation. This is a pig's knee, and if we take a look and remove the skin, we can see the structures underneath which hold the knee together. Uh, first of all, we can see the muscles, and on the bottom we have the hamstrings. And then back on top, we can see we have the quadriceps tendons which connect the muscles to the kneecap and then we also have the ligaments which are responsible for the bone to bone connections. Now if we simulate the rack and we start applying tension to the model you can see that first of all it's the muscles which are opposing this force and the muscle fibers are contracting and it's, it's trying to pull and hold the knee together. But if we keep on applying the tension we'll see that when we zoom in that the muscle is starting to give way, that the filaments of the muscle are, are tearing and the muscle itself is losing its ability to contract and hold the knee together and so we see the first signs of extension. Hold up. We've got movement here. We've got some creaking. We've got some creaking. Well, I think, I think that one of the tendons has gone just here. On the back of the knee joint. Yes, I thought I felt something crap. No, you did. Something definitely went there. I don't think there's going to be much further to go before it starts coming apart. I think probably we're finding that there's going to be, there's certainly some stretch inside the knee. Now, I just crank it up and let's keep going. So we've just seen that by continuing to apply tension to the knee, we have actually managed to rip the patella tendon out of its connection with the bone. Uh, and this has left the kneecap floating free. So if we zoom in and take a look, it's the Sharpie's fibers at the end of the tendon, which we can see here, which anchor the tendon into the bone, which have actually been ripped clean out of the bone. Now this area has got lots of blood vessels, it's got lots of nerve endings, so this injury is going to be very painful and very bloody. And if we go back to the wider scale, we can see that the only thing that hasn't been injured by the, the tension in the knee so far has been the elastic components, which are the ligaments. So whilst they've been stretched, they haven't been injured. Okay, slowly now. I can see it stretching, it's going. Yes, it's going. Hear that? Yes, it's, it's gone. gone. It's gone very easy now. That's it, it's gone. It's gone. We can see the two halves. Oh, well that's interesting. This isn't, this isn't what I expected at all. I thought the ligaments were gonna go. But look what's happened. It's fractured. Is that the actual bone? Has... The bone has fractured. You've pulled apart the bone. Good gracious. The joint itself... Is, is still articulating. Is still articulating. But, but what? What you've done is you've pulled the bone off. You've actually broken the bone. You've broken the bone with the, with the traction. The rack has pulled apart the bone and left the ligaments of the knee intact. This contradicts both the ancient accounts and modern expectations because bone is believed to be a stronger material than ligament. But what if this is not true in all cases? Could it be the rack's incremental build-up of tension that accounts for this surprising result? As we continue to apply tension, we can see that, finally, it's the bone itself which is pulled apart. And we can see that the growth plate, which is the area of the bone where new tissue forms, is the weakest part of the bone, and this is where the bone has actually ripped into two pieces. Because of the way in which the rack slowly increases tension, we can see that the elastic components, which are the ligaments, whilst they've been extended, they have survived effectively uninjured. The inelastic components in the joint, which are the tendon and the bone, have been ripped apart. This new insight into one of history's most common torture devices can be explained. Because ligaments are more elastic than bones, the gradual increase in tension stretches the ligaments, but breaks the bones. If the rack had pulled suddenly, however, the ligaments would have snapped and the bone remained intact. Well, that was really interesting. It didn't go quite like I thought it would. I had expected the ligaments to go, but what we had was a fracture. So I think we've actually discovered something today. And when we thought before that we'd have just a ligament rupture, now we know that if we put somebody on a rack, then probably they're going to get fractures. To pull a bone apart with such apparent ease, that really changes my view on how the rack acts on the body.
Meanwhile, in ancient Rome, an emperor devised a torture to entertain the crowds at the Colosseum. It was called the Tunica Molesta, and it turned the victim into a living fireball. In the ancient world, the masses were often entertained with displays of torture and death, and this was never truer than in the Roman games. These huge spectator events were put on in amphitheaters across the entire Roman Empire. We hear all kinds of accounts of very, very, very gruesome, very showy forms of torture being developed so that somebody can die an excruciating death in front of your eyes. One man who particularly enjoyed these ingenious new torments was the Emperor Nero. Among the Roman emperors, Nero stands out as kind of infamous for the, his use of uh, torture and public spectacles. He made them elaborate um, festivals of pain. Nero is remembered for one of the most spectacularly cruel tortures ever seen in the amphitheaters of Rome, a torture that turned a man into a human torch. An account written by the first century poet Lucilius describes a torture designed at the request of Emperor Nero. It was called the Tunica Molesta. The Tunica Molesta is a particularly unpleasant reenactment of the mythological death of Hercules. Hercules was tricked in myth into putting on a poisoned tunic. The poison burnt his flesh to the bone. The pain was so unbearable that Hercules set himself on fire. The Romans kind of act this out in the amphitheater, in which condemned criminals are forced to put on a tunic impregnated with inflammable material, and then it's set fire to. How was this torture designed to maximize the spectacle for the audience? By creating an explosive and long-lasting fireball on a living human being. It is hard to say for certain exactly what the tunica molesta would have looked like. It would have been a fabric uh, tunic, uh, probably linen, coated in flammable material. Pyrotechnic expert Scott McIntyre is investigating the flammable material that Nero might have used for the perfect human fireball. We're going to attempt to, to try and uh, maximize uh, the, the visual impact um, of having a burning garment. We could try out different materials to try and maximize that effect, get the flames as large as possible, to really try and just get as impressive a, a spectacle as possible. He will need to create fire on a linen tunic that ignites explosively with plenty of flames. The most easily ignited substance available was naphtha. It would have been around in Roman times. It's a very thin liquid, looks just like water, but uh, it contains uh, flammable uh, vapors that will be readily given off at this kind of temperature. Now that did ignite, possibly a little bit too quick because it's all gone. We did get an instant burst of flame there, but it didn't last very long. Uh, it was quite spectacular, but very, very short-lived. There is an historic document, however, Fox's Book of Martyrs, that suggests how large, rapid flames and a long-lasting burn may have been achieved. He had some dressed in shirts made stiff with wax and set on fire in his gardens. Nero's technicians could have used a wax or paste. By thickening a flammable liquid into a paste, they would have been able to apply more of the fuel to the linen, resulting in a longer-lasting burn. I have a thickening agent here. Uh, which hopefully mixed with the naphtha will allow us to bulk it up so we can actually get a large body of fuel on the garment and then hopefully we can extend that burning time and still harness the same properties that we have, the instant ignition, big yellow flames. Straight away, you can see it's sticking very, very well. Wow, that ignites instantly. And hopefully should burn quite a lot longer. Yeah, there's a lot more fuel burning there. The flames are quite ferocious, and it's gone right the way through the material. Probably would have gone right through to the skin. It's uh, three, four times the length of the previous burn, and it's still plenty of fuel. You can still see it on there. Once you cover somebody in that gel, there's no escaping it. It sticks to things, and it burns, and they're just going to be one mobile fireball. Scott has designed the perfect tunica molester. But how would it work on its victim, and just how spectacular would it be? 
find out, Scott is going to test his design on a real person, stuntman Steve Trulia. I think the most distressing thing about doing a full body burn as a stunt performer is that the fear wells up from inside you. It's a primeval fear. You feel as though you want to panic, scream, shout, run about, and part of our skill is to try and control that. Steve is preparing for his full body burn. He's wearing five layers of fire-resistant clothing, but no material is completely fireproof. The naphtha gel has not been used on a human being for thousands of years, and once it is alight, it's totally uncontrollable. Give a thumbs up if you're happy. welling up inside the flames in front of my face. Um, I can't imagine what that must be like for somebody that's really been burned. It doesn't bear thinking about someone being in just a, just a tunic. I think wanting to get the flames out of your face is the most important thing there. That's the, that's the primeval urge. I think anyone being burnt with a tunic or molester will have been running, I would think, almost anything uh, to get your face out of those flames. On that burn, the uh, flames went so high, so quickly, it, it surprised me. It's a sudden, full-size fireball. There's no build-up, it's just wallop, taking everybody by surprise. The test proves that it is possible to create a large fireball that will last for up to a minute, an agonizing spectacle. That felt different from most of the stunt burns that I do because I've been really aware since this job came in that this was really done to people. And I was aware of that throughout this, the whole tunica molester process. Um, so it felt different. It was more poignant in a way. And uh, it's made me quite pensive and thoughtful about the whole process. Whipping was a common form of punishment in the ancient world. The whip is and always has been a very, very effective device for, um, for um, causing pain for, for either punishment or for torture. The very simplicity of it is one of its great attributes. It was never more popular than in the Roman Empire. The Romans seemed to favor whipping. You know, famously, we think about Jesus Christ being flogged on his way to the cross. Flogging was a very, very usual form of, of punishment. This popularity led to developments in the technology of the whip, and the most fearsome of all was the scorpion. This has actually got metal attachments on the end which are hooked, and these are actually sharpened. So this is going to be a really very nasty device. If these hook into the flesh and they're snatched back, you know, one would imagine that these are going to cause quite significant injury. Could it rip skin, clean off the human back, or even cut down to the bone? Within the Roman Empire, punishment could only be administered under strict laws. There were special rules passed which um, only permitted a maximum of 40 strokes. It was a punishable offence to administer more than 40 lashes. Exceeding 40 strokes risked accidental death. What was often done, they would only actually inflict 39, so any errors of counting and then still be on the safe side. To discover what 39 scorpion lashes could do to flesh, Richard Windley will be joined by trauma surgeon Mike Edwards. They will test the effect of the whip on a pig carcass. Pig flesh is a close representation of human flesh because the skin and tissues are similar in both species. Richard administers 39 lashes of the scorpion. The pig's flesh will not show bruising or bleeding because it's not living tissue but it will reveal the physical effects of the tearing. Right, well, we can see here that there are lots of lots of little, about one centimetre lacerations. And here you can see this is quite a deep laceration. Yes. You can see from the, the structure of this hook here 
what the effect would have been as this thing had engaged. It would have stuck in the tissues, and then as you pulled it out, it would have ripped. If this were a living um, being, presumably this would be covered in blood by now. Oh yes, each one of these little, the little cuts you can see here would undoubtedly be bleeding. This would be red raw. But the law restricting the flogging to 39 lashes did not apply to everyone. Those condemned to crucifixion could be whipped until close to death. So what would happen if the scorpion was used for more than 39 lashes? You probably would have uh, started tugging the skin off. I think the chances are you could even be whipping down to the bone with something like this, and you'd be tearing the uh, strips of flesh off the ribs. This was the fate of thousands of men and women that were crucified under the Roman Empire. Before being hung on a cross, they endured countless strikes that cut into the bone. Another form of cruel punishment was used centuries later in medieval Europe, when the penalty, it was believed... ...should fit the crime. If the sin had been lying or blasphemy, the appropriate sentence was the pair of anguish. Hair is an insult, it's an assault on the human body. Our mouths are used in breathing, in eating, in communication, and the pear violates all of those. It was a device forged from iron, and it consisted of four petals secured around a central thread. Closed, it resembled a pear in size and shape, but as the handle was twisted, the petals slowly opened. It expanded outwards, extending its width threefold. A number of them still exist, but there are no surviving accounts of what this implement actually did to the human body. Ancient discoveries will investigate not only whether the pair could rip the mouth apart, but also whether the terror and injury it inflicted could lead to cardiac arrest. Forensic dentist, Dr. Catherine Adams, will analyze the effects of the pair of anguish on the mouth. The torture is, in many respects, the sheer horror of what this is going to do. Something is going to be inserted against your will into your mouth. The first obstacle to the torturer is going to be the teeth. The sheer weight of this is likely to actually fracture some of the teeth. The teeth are supplied by a massive number of nerve receptors, so the damage would cause immense pain. Once the pair is in, the idea was then to actually open it up so that the leaves would be expanding the jaw. They would be resting on the inner surfaces of the teeth and pushing those further and further apart. Eventually, the teeth would be forced from their sockets. If you've ever had a tooth extracted in the dentist, you know that the nerves will have been anaesthetized. But imagine having that without an anaesthetic. As the pair expands, what will happen is that the jaw will actually dislocate. Compounding this, there will be swelling at the back of the mouth. And it is possible that the airway could start to close over. The obstruction in the mouth, the shock, and the constriction of the windpipe would make breathing more and more difficult. This would lead to hypoxia, a reduced level of oxygen in the blood. The hypoxia is going to have significant effects on the rest of the body. The major organs will be starved of oxygen, in particular the brain, and eventually what that will do after a, a couple of minutes is that it's going to cause cardiac arrest. During this medieval period, the Inquisition sentenced thousands to be burnt at the stake. But did these victims actually die from burning, or was death caused by inhaling the flame itself? Medieval Europe was subjected to the Inquisition's reign of terror. The Inquisition was established by the Roman Catholic Church to crush opposition from heretics. 
Those found guilty of religious beliefs that opposed Catholicism were believed to have sinned against God and the church. Thousands of people were sentenced to death. Burning them was considered a mercy. It was believed that through the fires, a kind of taste of the fires of hell, there was the smallest chance that the victim might actually be able to receive redemption um, and salvation. It was the authorities trying to give them a chance at an eternal afterlife in heaven rather than consigned to the eternal flames of hell. Many historical texts still exist that describe the final moments of these victims. But there remains a fundamental mystery. How did fire actually kill people on the stake? Did they slowly burn to death, or did they die by inhaling the flame itself? In 1555, the Reverend John Hooper, Bishop of Gloucester, was burnt at the stake for refusing to convert from the Church of England to Catholicism. It was said that he slowly burnt to death while remaining conscious, and prayed even as his face blackened from the flames. An eyewitness account provides clues as to how he died. But even when his face was completely black with the flames and his tongue swelled, yet his lips went till they were sunk to the gums. And he knocked his breast with his hands. This holy martyr was more than three quarters of an hour consuming. But can a human body actually remain alive for 45 minutes in such a situation? It takes less time for him to die but probably the time for the whole body to be consumed would be around 45 minutes. I think it's more likely that his lips appeared to be moving because the uh, heat was causing the, um, the skin to retract and the lips moved as they became more burnt. When people burn, uh, their joints contract, and I would envisage that him beating his breast would be uh, his elbows contracting and his hands striking his chest. The observation was correct, but they've been interpreted in a way that wasn't quite appropriate. Mick Flanagan, the senior fire investigator of the South Wales Fire Service, is investigating this punishment to determine the exact cause of death. Fire can att attack you in two ways, by burning and by flame inhalation. Heat can be so great that it causes charring to the outer layers of the skin until eventually it goes beyond the live skin to the internal organs. A second way is if you inhale flame, the flames will then scorch and burn the air passages and the air passages will then swell and close up, thereby stopping you from breathing. Mick has erected three types of stake most commonly used in the executions. One has timbers to head height, another is surrounded by a ring of firewood, and the third has wood around its base. This is the type of stake that the Reverend John Hooper is believed to have died on. To determine cause of death, Mick will monitor the height of the flames and the temperature on each stake. If the temperature exceeds 60 degrees centigrade or 140 degrees Fahrenheit for more than 15 minutes, he will know that the victim died from burning. If the flames reach head height on the stake before this, the victim would have died from inhaling the flames. Almost immediately, there is a reading from one of the stakes. Because of the angle of the timbers on stake one, the flames have shot straight up to the level of where we've placed our sensors on the stake. They would be engulfed in flame really, really quickly. And that means they will have inhaled flame, and in inhaling the flames, that will quickly have brought about their death. If someone were to inhale flames, then what would be damaged would be the lining of the respiratory tree. If the throat is damaged by increased local heat, then it will swell up and it can actually stop you taking in air and getting it down to the lungs. The victim would die of suffocation, and if the flame reached even further into the lungs... It will also cause an inflammatory response and fluid will accumulate in the lungs, and effectively you can drown in your own secretions. So the person on the stake with the timbers to head height would be dead within two minutes. But what about the type of stake John Hooper was tied to? 
whoever was tied to that stake would now begin feeling the absolute agony of, of the, the skin coming away from their lower legs, working its way up their thighs and the lower parts of their body. Their injuries will get progressively more serious the longer this exposure lasts. Burns are rated from first to third degree. A first degree burn uh, involves literally just heating of the epidermis and all you see is redness of the skin. A second degree burn is one stage of pain more because there you see the epidermal layer or the most superficial layer stripped from underneath and blisters forming. And those blisters can be acutely painful because of the stretching of the overlying skin by the blister. The third degree burn is a full thickness burn. So it involves not only the epidermal layer, but it also involves the dermal layer. Past this point, the skin is dead and the fat, muscle and organs underneath are being destroyed. The victim is still alive and conscious whilst their lower body is being burnt away. This suffering lasts only a few more minutes until the flames reach the face. They will have inhaled flame, and the same as with stake number one, they're going to have burns to the inside of the windpipe, which is quickly going to bring about their death. So after five minutes, two of the victims would have died from inhaling flame. It takes another 10 minutes for the person in the ring of fire to die due to third degree burns to the whole of the body. The temperature of that fire has been about 140 Fahrenheit for a number of minutes now, and the person there would have been suffering uh, massive burns to the whole of the body because the fire is all around them. So the flames has not actually touched them, but it's the intense heat from the fire that would have brought about huge burns. After 15 minutes, all of the victims would have died, but the causes of death varied. We know that in stakes one and two, the fire would attack the people tied to that stake by flame inhalation whereas on the third stake, it's the radiated heat that would have caused the death. So modern analysis has shown what really caused people to die on the stake. This discovery can shed new light on the death of the Reverend John Hooper. Historical documents depict him burning on a stake surrounded at its base with firewood. If this is accurate, then he would first have suffered serious burns to the legs, followed minutes later by injury to the windpipe brought on by flame inhalation. And the Reverend John Hooper would have died from drowning as his lungs filled up with fluid. Perhaps the most gruesome form of torture in history was specifically designed to prolong suffering. Its creator ruled over medieval Transylvania, where he was given the nickname Devil. His real name was Vlad Dracula. Impalement has been used for at least 3,000 years, but one man took this method of torture to a terrifying extreme. Vlad Dracula, also known as Vlad the Impaler. The reason that we remember Vlad is because he was a man of quite exceptional cruelty. His legendary bloodlust inspired the Count Dracula myth. Future generations would associate him with the undead, with vampirism. But the original Dracula was even more terrifying than anything that could be created by Bram Stoker or Hollywood or anyone else. Vlad Dracula impaled his victims in the most terrifying way ever seen. Vlad's favorite method of impalement was horrific. He did it vertically, inserting the stake through the rectum so that it went right up through the core of the body to emerge through the mouth. What is most horrific is the fact that it took so long for people to die, that the stake was arranged just so through the body so that death would not come quickly. It is torture for its own sake. Historical accounts describe victims surviving fully impaled for hours or even days. Experts have dismissed these stories as folklore. But can modern science show that it's actually possible to impale a human body through its very core in such a precise way that the victim could survive for up to two days. Criminologist and historian Merian Tro is traveling to the heart of modern-day Romania 
to discover the real Dracula, 500 years after his death. Vlad Dracula was one of several rulers of Wallachia in the Middle Ages, the country today we call Romania. The Middle Ages was a vicious time when cruelty was acceptable. But the legend of Vlad is that he went beyond that. This is almost certainly the kind of stake that Vlad the Impaler would have used. It's made from pine, and Wallachia is full of pine forests. And he had in his army a team of men who were called Amlas. And their job was to look out for straight timbers like this in a forest. They would then cut the tree down, uh, and they would sharpen that end. That's the end that goes into the ground, and I think four men would be able to do that job very, very quickly indeed, in minutes. And this end, therefore, is the end that would be inserted into a human body. But could Vlad really have devised a way to make his victims survive for hours or even days on the stake? Trauma surgeon Dr. Mike Edwards and three-dimensional graphics designer James Dean are investigating this seemingly impossible claim. If a stake is traveling through the pelvis and abdomen into the chest, all these areas are very richly supplied with uh, blood vessels and nerves and organs. The chances of uh, one of these vital structures being hit are exceedingly high. If the major blood vessels or organs are damaged, death will be rapid. People probably wouldn't be able to live more than a few minutes. James and Mike will impale a computer-generated body to discover whether there is a path from rectum to mouth that can avoid these delicate structures. If such a route exists, then it is possible that Vlad could also have discovered it and thus devised a method of impaling that prolonged death. We're using a 3D model of a person. We can have a look at the bones, we can see the organs, we can see the blood vessels. And we can manipulate that in 3D and see if we can find a route to get a stake to go through it. So this is the, the stake here. If you insert it to this level here, which is about the level of the fifth lumbar vertebrae. So up to about here. Now there's the point. We're in the danger area here. The stake is advancing through the pelvis. If it damages either of the major blood vessels, the vena cava or aorta, the victim would die from internal bleeding within minutes. Now, if you advance the stake a little bit further, the stake is coming up behind the bladder, but in front of the main blood vessels. Now, if when, say, Vlad was experimenting with this, he found that people were dying very quickly, he perhaps might uh, decide to alter the angulation to try yep. and avoid those vessels. We've avoided the, uh, the main blood vessels. So the person will be suffering no life-threatening injuries at this point, but the stake must proceed next through the bowel. Now, it's perforated through there. I think it's got to perforate. OK. Uh, there's no way that it could travel all the way up here and all around there. It would seem impossible to impale someone in this way without puncturing the bowel an injury that releases a flood of bacteria into the body cavity, leading to infection and death within two days. It must have been absolutely uh, astonishing amount of pain. And the sort of mind that would want to inflict this, you, know, you, you, can, uh, you just can't imagine, can you? Vlad grew up in a violent world. Wallachia was at war with the Turks, and Dracula had been a child prisoner. Dracula was a prisoner of the Turks from the age of 12, and he learned cruelty at their hands. Because of the way of life at the Turkish court, he may well have been sexually assaulted. This, he saw, was a means of revenge. He could use the notion of that sexual assault, and he could twist it in his own mind into impalement. And it colored the whole of the rest of Dracula's life. The victim has been skewered through half of his body, but amazingly would still be alive. He can breathe and blood still pumps around the body, the two systems vital to sustain life. Now Mike and James must navigate past the heart and lungs. If this stake went a little bit backwards and through the heart, then death would be within minutes, very quickly. I think we need to maximize this space between the heart and the back of the sternum because then that will allow our stake to travel up and push the heart backwards rather than perforate it. 
the sternum or breastbone would deflect the steak back into the body. Scraping up the inside of the sternum, we haven't perforated the lungs, and um, it's although it may, obviously it must be presenting problems with breathing, I would say breathing would be very difficult and very laboured. Let's just advance the steak, shall we? And let's see how much it impinges the windpipe. It's my impression that probably they would be feeling, if they were still alive, they would be feeling this coming through. And the natural reaction would be to pull the head backwards to allow this thing to come up. Now it's going on up and up and up. And let's put it right the way through now. In order to survive, the airway must be clear. Yep. And I think, you know, at this point where it's coming through the neck, that is not compatible with life because you no longer have an airway. At first inspection, it seems impossible to impale someone and keep them alive for days. Death would occur due to suffocation. But James has an idea. Thinking about it, it could be, the taper on it could be much longer, in which case the bit that's coming through the neck and mouth could actually be quite a lot thinner. If the taper on the end of the stake was narrower, it would not block the victim's windpipe and prevent breathing. If this is possible, the ancient accounts might actually be correct. While James and Mike continue to investigate, Merion is at the scene of Vlad's most gruesome victory. This was in 1462, when Vlad led Wallachia in a war against the Turks. His army was only a third of the size of that of the Turks. They were well-trained, well-disciplined, well-organized, and Vlad's army was none of those things. All he has left is shock tactics. And here, in a field, he impaled, according to some accounts, up to 20,000 people. Some of them would have been captured Turks, but most of them were his own people. They were men, they were women, they were children. When the Turks saw that, they stopped in their tracks. Mehmed II, their leader, was astonished and appalled. According to some accounts, he turned his horse around and rode back, and his army followed. The field of the impaled has got to be the most dramatic and dynamic use of torture for intimidation the world has ever seen. Vlad was responsible for this terrible massacre. But could this horror have been made even worse? Could Vlad have acted to keep those 20,000 people alive on the stakes? When the stake came through the mouth, it was too wide and would have suffocated the victim within a few minutes. James is thinning the taper on the stake in an attempt to open the airway and therefore slow death. We can see straight away there that the airway is not compromised that much. They're potentially still alive. So this is potentially how Vlad did it, I think. I think we might have, we might have made a discovery here. I think it's entirely possible that he might have been able to. to I think so. It, when you present it this way, you can see it as a clear passageway, can't you? From the rectum right the way through to the top of the neck. So I think we have to take those contemporary texts fairly seriously now. Yeah, I would agree. Vlad put thousands of people to death by impaling them. With this number of executions, it's easy to imagine how he might have experimented with different stake shapes and sizes and different methods to finally develop the most drawn out and agonizing procedure possible. I was initially unsure as to whether this could have been done. Even when I saw it on 3D reconstruction, I could hardly believe it, but now I think I believe it. Amazingly, the myths surrounding Vlad's extraordinary cruelty could be true. The thousands of men, women and children that Dracula killed could have taken up to two days to die while fully impaled on a stake. Ancient discoveries has shown how the most bizarre, mysterious and sophisticated torture devices may have worked and how ancient torturers used their knowledge of technology and anatomy to develop ever more gruesome techniques. When the darkest side of human imagination combined with the power of man's ingenuity, the result was a surprisingly sophisticated ancient torture technology.